Hi, I'm Alyssa, the college expert. I've been helping kids get into college since 2006, and I am so excited to talk to you today about the war on the SAT and whether or not it's misguided. The New York Times published this article called The Misguided War on the SAT, which I absolutely adored. The graphic was like these little battleships on multiple choice Scantron paper. So cute, so perfect. Very excited to get you up to speed with everything that's happening in that debate. So before I start, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to turn on notifications. The Ivy League universities, they are now changing their tune on standardized testing. Dartmouth is following MIT now in requiring standardized testing for applicants, and it's reigniting a debate over whether testing helps or hurts low-income students. This week, Yale announced they will return to requiring standardized test scores for student applications starting in the fall of 2025, a shift from the current test optional policy allowing students to submit advanced placement or pre-college courses instead, which according to Yale, can inadvertently disadvantage students from low-income, first-generation, and rural backgrounds. If you've been following me at all over the past several years, you know my campaign for the SATs. We have found that, especially for students of color coming out of high schools that are not well-known to colleges, the SAT can be the only thing that says to a college, hey, this student will be able to be successful at your college. Because other than that, they look at the student's transcript, see a lot of A's, and then say, what do these A's even mean? Everybody gets A's, right? Because great inflation is rampant. And they also have no idea what this high school's A means versus this high school's A. So the GPA doesn't actually tell the school very much at all. Whereas if you have a test that everybody's taking, that everybody finds difficult, and this student from this school, which is underrepresented at Harvard, does well, and this other student doesn't, that says this student's probably going to make it at Harvard, and this student probably isn't. We have been seeing this from the beginning. We knew this before the pandemic, before things went test optional. Everything went test optional. I was like, oh my God, what's going to happen to my kids? So all the things that I've been worried about, all the causes that I've been trying to trumpet this whole time, finally, the New York Times published an article literally articulating all the things that I've been trying to say this whole time. So I am so grateful that I am no longer the only person saying this, and I hope that this means students will be able to use the SAT for the thing that it's actually useful for. In case you're not familiar with the argument, I'm going to take you through all of the points from the New York Times article and help you understand exactly why the SAT is a thing that is helping, especially first generation, low SES, Bill Pock students from underserved schools. First thing to know is that a lot of people say, well, high school GPA is the most predictive. That's actually not true, and data shows us that that's not true. So you'll see the graph, and this is from the New York Times article, that test scores are wildly more predictive than GPA. GPA has only some predictive power over whether or not people will be going to grad school, what kind of grades they'll get in college, whereas test scores are significantly more predictive in those realms. We know that test scores are useful and are predictive, which a lot of people have said for a long time that they aren't. Those people are wrong, and these studies make that clear, make that explicit. Without tests, so here's another point that he makes. Without test scores, admissions officers have a hard time distinguishing kids who will be able to do well and kids who will not. Before the pandemic, back when everybody was requiring test scores, admissions officers from colleges told me point blank that if students couldn't get 500, 500, if they were going into a non-STEM major or 550, 550 for a STEM major, they just would not be able to hack college level work. And so I don't think that has changed, but now we're no longer willing to put a number on it. So we are more likely to take a chance on people that we actually don't know if they'll be able to hack college level work. And when the author of the New York Times article went and talked to college admissions people, they were like, yeah, we're just guessing. They literally said these things to him. And I was like, oh my God. Which you know what? They are worried that it's politically incorrect to have this opinion, so they don't want to say it too loudly, and most of them won't go on the record saying it. This was really interesting. An academic study released last summer by the group Opportunity Insights covering the Ivy Plus colleges, which includes like MIT and Duke, Stanford, University of Chicago, along with the Ivies, showed little relationship between high school grade point average and success in college. The researchers found a strong relationship between test scores and later success. And so that's what you're looking at in the graphs. Here's another piece of information that's really interesting. The relative advantage of test scores has grown over time. Interesting. And so one of the things that the article talks about is how grade inflation has gotten significantly worse 
He talked about how fewer kids got A's in the past. So basically just now people are afraid not to give A's. We work in cities where they institute a 90% pass rate. That means 90% of the kids pass whether they should or not. And there are a lot of schools where, and I have friends who are teachers, who have talked to me about this at length. If you want to fail a kid, the amount of paperwork that you have to fill out, if you want to give a kid a grade that is not going to make them on the path to college, you're staring at a lot of parental backlash because the parents going to show up and say, well, this grade could keep my kid out of college. Well, teachers aren't necessarily interested in having a big fight, right? So grades are just going up across the board. Everybody knows they matters and everybody wants their kids to do well. So grades are getting to the point where they mean significantly less than they used to. I think the main criticism of the test is that it's racist. So the New York Times article unpacks this quite a bit. First, I should make clear that there are gaps along racial and economic lines in average SAT scores. Upper income students do better on average than lower income. White and Asian students do better on average than Black and Latinx students. And that's probably the main point that the critics of the test make. They say, look at these gaps, the test must be biased. But let's start with test prep. Evidence suggests the test prep doesn't actually move the needle hardly at all. The best way to see that is by looking at the other tests that millions of students across the country take, but don't take test prep for. The best known one is the Nation's Report Card, also known as the NAEP. Many students take that, and every time it comes out, educators go up into a frenzy because most recently when it came out, all of my friends were like, oh my God, did you see the scores? They're dismal. We're going back. Everything's bad. And so these gaps in the SAT and the NAEP are both along economic and racial lines. And what we are finding is that the gaps in the SAT are basically the same ones as in the NAEP. So that implies that what we're seeing in the SAT doesn't have anything to do with the test. It only has to do with the same things that this other test that nobody preps for is also picking up. And it probably realistically has to do with inequality in America. I mean, there's incredible inequity in a variety of metrics. It makes sense that that would show up in education. I mean, we know how it plays out in schools. It makes sense that it would show up on test scores. In the words of the Daily, the SATs are actually mirroring back American reality, showing this deep problem that we have. Effectively, they're the messenger and you're saying, don't shoot it. Then the argument is, well, if there are these gaps and the SAT is showing these gaps, then why are we, why do we want to use it in college admissions? One big thing to point out is that the argument is often misunderstood. I think when people talk about the test, they have this vision that the SAT is the only thing colleges are using to say, you get in, you don't get in, you get in, you don't get in. But in fact, it is a tool that they're using in conjunction with GPAs, extracurricular, essay, teacher recommendations, all of the stuff that goes into a traditional college application. But it gives more information, more insight, more of a window into who will this student be when they're on a college campus. Yet almost nobody in higher education favors using tests as the main factor for admissions. The question instead is whether the scores should be one of the criteria used to identify qualified students from every demographic group. You know, we live in an incredibly polarized society. Everything is in terms of sound bites. Like, is it short enough to put on Twitter to make a TikTok? The nuance gets kind of smushed out of the argument. And so what happens is instead of saying, hey, this is a complex question about how the SAT is one of a cocktail of factors in understanding a student's holistic possible performance at a college, they're like, the SAT is bad. Let's not use it, you know? And I think we've all seen how arguments can get unnuanced over the course of their repetition. This was an interesting point. Some people worry that the SAT scores are merely a proxy for income or race, but the data should alleviate this concern. The SAT scores are not merely a proxy for income or race. Within every racial group, students with higher scores do better in college. And the same is true among poor students and among richer students. If you look at student test scores and college grades, they're almost a one-to-one -one relationship regardless of what kind of high school the students went to, whether it was advantaged or disadvantaged. So you're probably wondering, wow, if there's so much data and it's clearly a useful extra variable, especially when we're thinking about low SES students coming from underperforming or underrecognized high schools and demonstrating that, hey, I'm a kid who can make it at Harvard. Why aren't we interested in reinstituting the tests? This was interesting. Several told me, when I've asked university administrators whether they were aware of the research showing the value of test scores, they have generally said that they were. But several told me not for quotation, that they fear the political reaction on their campuses and in the media if they reinstated tests. It's not politically correct. Charles Deacon, the longtime admissions dean at Georgetown, which does require test scores, has told the journalist Jeffrey Salenga. 
And Jeffrey Salingo wrote the book, Who Gets In and Why, A Year Inside College Admissions. He basically sat inside three college admissions offices for a year and watched how they interacted with students' applications, which was fascinating. Reading that book was unbelievable. So this man has his finger on the pulse of what's going on with college admissions. So this was even more interesting. In 2020, the University of California system went further than most colleges and announced, despite its own data showing the predictive value of the tests, that it would no longer accept test scores, even for applicants who wanted to submit them. And so as a person who was watching that in 2020, I remember the University of California did this big study and they were like, yes, the SATs and ACTs have predictive power. Yes, they are useful. And then a month later, literally a month later, they're like, we're not using the SAT, ACT anymore. And I was like, what? What's that be? That doesn't make any sense. I guess it's not politically correct. I guess that's the answer. But I think another thing that I had not thought about, people are anxious, and part of the reason they're anxious is the Supreme Court decision last year that forbids colleges from using race in college admissions. So in the wake of that decision, it's very clear that people on the political right, some of the same people who brought that lawsuit that led to the Supreme Court decision, are going to be scouring the college admissions process and look for signs that the college had deviated from what the Supreme Court has said they can do. So a system the use of the SAT has potential to give grist to those conservative critics. They can say, hey, wait a minute, you admitted this kid of one race with a 1400 and you rejected this kid of another race with a 1500. Whereas a system without standardized tests is just fuzzier and nobody can point at you. I want to make sure that I've clearly articulated the argument of how kids are being hurt in a system where they don't take the test or where kids without scores who are from underserved high schools that are not well known by the college need to take the SAT in order to prove that they will be able to do well at the college. Admissions officers have a better sense, a much better sense of exactly what the classes and the grades and the transcripts mean at the magnet schools and private schools because every year have multiple applicants to these schools. It's the high schools that don't have that many applicants to the school where they're looking at these kids with straight A's and they're choosing among kids, all of whom have approaching straight A's at different high schools that the standardized test can be particularly helpful in saying, this is the kid who's likely to thrive on our campus. MIT is maybe an interesting story to turn to now. MIT reinstituted the SAT post-pandemic. And they were one of the only ones who came out and said, hey guys, we need the SAT. We can't build a good class without the SAT. Because what they found is that their foundational curriculum is super rigorous. And if you don't have certain math and science fundamentals, you won't be able to make it. Remember what the admissions officers told me so long ago, if students didn't have a certain SAT score, they would not be able to make it. MIT just kind of came out and articulated that loudly and said, hey, guys, without this SAT score, people are not going to be able to get for our math and science classes, which makes total sense. But then, of course, there's the argument, well, if you're looking at test scores, maybe you're going to end up with a less diverse class. And so diversity comes in multiple incarnations. One is race and the other is income. Obviously, in this country, there is a strong correlation because of the systematic oppression that has happened between race and socioeconomic status, right? But one is not the other, and they are not necessarily proxies for the other. They need to be considered differently and overlapping at the same time. MIT, this is so interesting. Without test scores, Schmel explained, and Stuart Schmel is the MIT admissions guy. Admissions officers were left with two unappealing options. They would have to guess which students were likely to do well at MIT, and almost certainly guess wrong sometimes, rejecting qualified applicants while admitting weaker ones. Or, MIT would need to reject more students from less advantaged high schools and admit more schools from the private schools and advantaged public schools that have a strong track record of producing well-qualified students. And that's exactly what I predicted would happen if we got rid of the SAT. Literally that sentence would need to reject more students from less advantaged high schools and admit more from the private schools and advantaged public schools with a strong record. That's it. That's obvious. Like that's their only choice. Once we brought the test requirement back, we admitted the most diverse class that we have ever had in our history, Chanel told me. Having test scores was helpful. In MIT's current first year class, 15% of students are Black, 16% are Hispanic, 38% are White, and 40% are Asian. 20% receive Pell Grants. And so Pell Grants go to students in the lowest economic stanine, and that's a way to tell whether the school is truly socioeconomically diverse. Are they serving my population, my students? Are they serving the students that we are working to get into the engine of socioeconomic mobility? And so MIT is 20% for Pell is a great number. That's amazing. Here in the article, it says that share is higher than at many other elite schools. Let me tell you, great number, real happy. 
When you don't have test scores, the students who suffer most are those with high grades at relatively unknown high schools, the kind that rarely send kids to the Ivy League. The SAT is their lifeline. And this is Deming, a Harvard economist, who says this. Very interesting. My hope, and I think that the New York Times is calculated in the way that they do this. It's 2024. We in the college access world have known that this is an issue since 2020, since colleges dropped the SAT. It's now been four years. People have had time to study it. So what that says to me is that I am not the only person who thought this was going to be a problem as soon as the colleges dropped the test, right? Other really smart people also thought, hmm. That's a problem. But they probably said, you know what? We can't just say it's a problem. We got to study it. We got to have some data because this is going to be politically difficult to prove. And everybody has a, a dog in the fight, right? Everybody has a thing that they're trying to prove for a reason. And we want some actual data to look at. So my guess is they went away. They ran some studies. They looked at the data. They did it as fast as they could. And then when they had something that they were really sure about, they were like, okay, we're ready to go. And that's when they released the information. And the New York Times has probably been waiting on this and waiting until there was something credible. Because when I tried to publish my article in 2021, we shopped it with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And we were told, specifically at the New York Times, that this was not in line with what the editorial board believed about test scores. And so my guess is that this is a politically unpopular opinion, as they make reference to in the article and on the daily, and they had to have some real data to back it up. So now they do. Now that they published it, they also want to talk about it on the daily, partially to draw more attention to it because they think it's something that needs to be paid attention to and probably also to make sure that they are rebutting any critics. Because anytime you come up with something polarizing, a lot of people have a lot of stuff to say. And so they were like, all right, let's dot all of our T's and cross all of our I's and let's do a daily on it. So I'm curious to see what happens next. It's possible that some colleges are going to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, actually, we're going to reinstitute the SAT because college boards, trustee boards are going to read this. And they're significantly more conservative generally than the administration itself of the college. And they're going to be like, hey, the SAT does matter. you got to bring this back. Probably internally, there's going to be some fight between the trustees and the administration. Some will win, some will lose but we'll probably see more schools returning to SAT requirements. The other thing that might happen, and this actually is a very interesting prediction, colleges may start turning up the heat on how much they prefer students who've taken the SAT and submitted those scores. Like they may not change anything public about their policies, but they may say, hey, we actually know that this matters and be significantly more interested in students who are submitting SAT scores. So they can assume that if you don't submit test scores, you're getting 1,300-ish in terms of their landscape. And that gives them kind of a, a number to hang on to. I mean, I don't know. This is just a guess, right? Just hypothesis. But I'm sure that this coming out is going to create a lot of tension and a lot of conversations. And at the end of the day, that's what it's supposed to do, right? We're supposed to be having conversations. These are complex, nuanced questions. There's a lot of factors at play. And it's important for us to try to get it right. It's important for us to try to be fair because one of the other things that they talk about in the article is, is the role of a college socioeconomic mobility, like kind of being an engine of change or so that we can have the best cures for cancer and the best climate change solutions. So they say in the article and in the daily that most colleges would answer both. And I think that's right. For some colleges, they really can embrace both. Maybe the colleges are the very tippity top of the selectivity pyramid. But I think for the colleges who are not quite at the tippity top of the selectivity pyramid, they may have to make a choice. I don't know what they're going to choose. It probably has to do with the sort of political leanings of their board of trustees, what part of the country they live in and what the socioeconomic situation is with the group of students that they're trying to aid, like all of that stuff. Like it's a wild cocktail. So hopefully that was at least interesting. I think for parents and students at home, the takeaway is that taking SAT scores and submitting them can multiply your chance of getting in times seven, not 7%, 7 but seven times. If we already know that's the case before this article came out, my guess is this article is going to make it even more important. And what that probably means is that you should take the SATs. Sorry. As you probably know, the SATs have gone digital. You might be worried about the fact that the SAT, the College Board, has only released four practice tests. We have an additional almost 10. That might be useful. If you decide you want to prep, we're happy to help. All that stuff. You know, it's a scary landscape. As college gets harder to get into, getting a full ride becomes more important because the cost of college is going up and the number of people applying who can't necessarily pay for all of it is going up. 
so it becomes more competitive, more people competing for fewer spots, all that stuff. Your best bet is to be the most competitive applicant you can be. Make sure your college application is the most beautiful and it sings your song the best that it can. So today, we talk about whether or not the SAT is a useful tool in college admissions. So I'm curious, as you are thinking about taking the SAT, are you planning to take it? Are you not? Does the fact that the SAT just went digital change your mind at all? Does the fact that you can take the SAT in your school, likely, there's a school administration, does that change your mind at all? What are the factors that make you decide to do prep or not? Please leave me a comment. I love when people leave me information in the comments because that helps me know things that there's no other way that I would know. Like we would not have a conversation if you don't leave it in the comments. So I love when people leave comments, it's great. And if you're worried about prepping for the SAT, we have been getting ready for it and we are excited about it. And don't tell anyone this, but I actually think the new SAT is significantly easier than the old SAT. So maybe we're really lucky that they redesigned it.